Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Eli Mazur. Um, I work with Paul Foreman every day at Mizrahi. And it's a friend of the Everyone knows Paul, right? So, um, so we have a tremendous opportunity to have a guest here um, who's actually here for a number of reasons. Um, Nata Barak, as you read in the biography that we sent around, is the, um, is the developer of the, of the Iron Dome system, a system that has saved countless lives and has protected Israel and has to give the leaders of the Israeli government the ability to have patience and work on solving problems in very creative ways. And it really has been a transformative um, device and a transform something that very, very seldom does a defensive device really transform the playing field for a country. And because of it, around the world, it's really been tremendous Kiddush Hashem, more than even, even on top of the fact that just saving lives is, is something to, to, um, to think about. Now, the reason why uh, Natam Barak is here specifically now is that he's coming with um, the Yeshivot Bnei Akiva. Now, we know here in, in Toronto, there's, there's the Bnei Akiva schools, but Bnei Akiva schools in Toronto is actually an anomaly. It's the only Bnei Akiva school outside of Israel. Bnei Akiva schools in Israel is the Upanot and Yeshivot of Bnei Akiva. There's over 75 different institutions in Israel. There's 14,000 students, 25,000 students? 24,000. 24,000 students. Today, right now, in Yeshivot Bnei Akiva, it is one of the largest um, um, Rishatot, Rishatot in English, sorry. Network. Um, networks, network, that's the word? <laughs> one of the largest networks in Israel, and the reason why Natan Barak is so connected to Yeshiva Bnei Akiva is because there's a belief that the reason why Israel right now is at the forefront of everything that's happening technologically, and the reason why Israel is able to always stay one, two, three, four, even ten steps ahead of all of its neighbors is because of its youth. It's because of the programs that they put in place in order to ensure that in every generation, Israel will always be at the forefront. <coughs> and so it's incredibly important to understand that when you're thinking about Israel's future, it's not just thinking about the programs right now. It's not just funding an Iron Dome. It's not just the, uh, the next up-and-coming um, up uh, technology that's happening, but rather Israel is all about making sure that we start at the first step. We start in the schools, we start in the elementary schools, we start in the high schools. And therefore, Natan Barak has given his time and a lot of it as energy put into encouraging and developing programs for students in the Akiva, Yeshivot, and Opanot in order to make sure that they're always going to be at the forefront. We're going to show a little bit of those <coughs> ideas and what's happening in the Yeshivot because it's really incredible and it's really the future of, of Medinat Yisrael. And without further ado, we can see the product right now of the Iron Dome, and it's really a tremendous pleasure to introduce Natan Barak to share a few words with us. Um, we should dim the lights a little bit, right? So, yeah, yeah. Better turn the you want to start? Right. Okay. All right. Start so, I'll, I'll finish. I'll finish. You'll finish. Um, if we'll, can we turn off a little bit of the love? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. There we go. That one's Okay. So first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, we have a very uh, interesting and uh, welcoming uh, community. We have been here for Saturday, uh, and two of my neighbors, uh, one of them is next door to me, and the other one, same street, are coming from Toronto. Adorable family, we love them, and we hope you will come uh, as soon as you can to Israel. We have a dialogue between me and my wife. My wife thinks that we better have some Jewish all over the world. <coughs> <laughs> I personally prefer that you be in Israel, but in any case, uh, thank you. I, I have learned in, uh, in the high school, I was uh, in Akiva, my daughter was in uh, Amana, which is uh, part of uh, Akiva, and uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about it uh, later more, later more, uh, I speak about it later a little bit more. Um, when Naftali asked me uh, to come and uh, speak about Akiva, I thought that uh, it's part of Akarat Tov, and I really believe it. From my point of view, there are three 
foundation of Israel. The first one is the spirit of the people of Israel. Um, I think that I don't have to expect about that. The other one is the economics, which depend a lot on the technology. And the third one is the defense, the, the, the security, which also depend too much about on a, on a, a scientist and the technology and so on. Uh, and I believe that we can do a lot more than what we are doing right now in Nakiva, and we need your support for that. I'm retired colonel from the Israel Navy. I was in charge on the C4I. Mm-hmm. C4I stands for Command, Control, Communication, and Computers in the Israel Navy. And when I retired back in 2003, I uh, founded the, this company, which is now owned uh, by the founders, by Raphael, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, defense industry worldwide, and by General Electric, which you probably know, she has, they decided uh, last year that we have the best platform for controlling not just in the defense, because <coughs> we are operating both in the defense and commercial. We are controlling uh, uh, electrical uh, power plant uh, <coughs> companies, uh, vehicle fleet management, smart cities, and a lot of other things. We are going to talk about, uh, about uh, Iron Dome. I'll take you a little bit back to... Uh, 2006, where we have been observing uh, a lot of injuries. People have been uh, 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 died from uh, those rockets that ca- came from Lebanon, and for uh, many years we have su- we have been suffering for from the rockets that coming from Gaza and from uh, Lebanon, and we couldn't really do anything. The way that it uh, was working is they wanted us to get in into Gaza. They have prepared or to Lebanon. They have prepared a lot of ammunition and other things. They were firing at us. We had to respond. Then we came in, and uh, it was like a catch-22. Where they have uh, been uh, uh, causing us damage, both for the civilians and for, and for the military. We tried at the very beginning to catch the launcher, but we uh, realized that we cannot really find them. First of all, they used to hide them uh, pretty well, uh, like uh, what we see here. This is the this is the track of the Palestinian Authority, and when we bomb this kind of track, they tell us that we are uh, damaging the the Oslo agreement and all those kind of things uh, uh, by shooting at them, but uh, it's almost impossible to detect those kind of uh, uh, launcher. But right now there are uh, tactics or strategies to put those launcher within the hospitals, within the kidney gardens and so on, begging us to uh, fire on them. What we could have done is we could send uh, interceptor for the rocket and the second one to the launcher but they are putting the launcher in places where they are asking us <coughs> to bomb them so they will be able to show the CNN how we are killing children and so on. So we are not running after the launcher uh, anymore. The launcher is not something that we uh, will be capable of uh, uh, damaging, so we have to defend ourselves. There are different type of uh, rockets that we have to deal with, but the, the main point is that we are not really fighting the Hezbollah, we are not really fighting the Gaza Strip, what we are fighting is the uh, finance that coming from Iran, giving them a lot of motivation to fire at us. It, it's not that they don't know that we are going to, uh, uh, to, to shoot them back and so on, but they are getting paid from Iran millions and billions of dollars just to uh, throw at us uh, all those bombs. So it's very complicated uh, situations. There are different type of uh, of rockets that they are firing at us. The ones that are more most uh, complicated are the <coughs> smallest one because they are very high, very hard to detect. Uh, we have a very short time to respond, less than a second. I'm going to show them and show you what we are, what we have to do in this uh, second, this time frame to be capable of uh, uh, firing our interceptor. The longer one are the ones that are coming to uh, Tel Aviv, and Netanya, and other places. Those are the easier one because we have 
more than 30 seconds to get prepared, we can be sure what we are, what we are eating. So also uh, the people who are living in the center nearby Tel Aviv are making a lot of noises from uh, the fact that they are shooting at us. But these are the easiest uh, one. Uh, the people from the road that have suffered for more than uh, seven years from those rockets are uh, the, the, the ones that are very pro problematic. Um, we have three uh, level of defense, uh, active defense, what we call. The uh, first level is the Iron Dome. It was intended, based on the newspaper, to deal with four to uh, 70 kilometers. Uh, and this is kind of, well, suppose, was supposed to be for the short range. On the top of it was is the David Sling, which has to care, take care about a longer range and so on. Uh, and the third level is uh, the error. But the error is uh, uh, shooting the rockets outside of the atmosphere. Uh, but to understand the difference between all those solutions, the main point is to understand the economy of of uh, this uh, of our problem. Iron Dome cost, based on the newspaper, forty thousand dollar. We don't publish that, so if we if you are going to put it on the YouTube, please delete this because we are selling this uh, system to other countries, and we don't want them to know how much it is sold uh, internally. So, so is that is that a per per missile or per setup? Per interceptor, per missile. Per, yes. per missile interceptor. Yeah. Yeah. So you want us to say 400,000 and put it on tape? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we sell it for more than 100,000 each. So we'll be able to get our money back and to have the next generation. In any, any case, sometimes in specific places, we are, uh, we are firing more than one. Let's say if we are talking about uh, power plants, if they are trying to shoot our uh, refineries or whatever, so in this case we want to make, uh, to be sure, 99.9999%, then we shoot two of them. Everything is done automatically. We define the priority and the level of the priority of each area based on uh, the threats and other criteria, and we can shoot automatically two of them. So if the first one is not... Uh, uh, hitting the, the rockets, the second one will uh, hit it. In any case, if this uh, cost, by, based on the newspaper, $40,000, David Sling cost more than $1 million, and the error cost between 2 to $3 million, depending on the version of the error. Now, usually what we will, what, what's happened in this case, we are trying to expand the capability of Iron Dome, which seems, again, based on the newspaper, to be ca capable of dealing with all of our neighbors, excluding, exclu excluding Iran. For Iran, probably we'll have to use other interceptor because if it is non-conventional threats, we don't want it to be, uh, to, to be intercepted in our uh, country. It probably want it to be in uh, another country. So, so this is the dilemma. The dilemma here is economical, mainly it's an economical issue, uh, and that's why we have to continue keep on developing <coughs> Iron Dome to be capable of shooting more, uh, uh, more into more rockets in the same time, and to be capable of uh, dealing with more and more uh, type of uh, rockets. Just so to get you, you yeah. sorry, back to the doll, <coughs> back to the dollars and cents. Do you see? The Euro missile was a million dollars per intercept? Yeah. Euro two million dollars, three, three million dollars is Euro two and Euro three. Euro three costs about three million dollars each. And that's interballistic. That's an interballistic. Yeah, it's out, outside of the atmosphere. It can deal with any type of uh, of rockets that so might Because I know, like, I'm just trying to think the pricing. Like, it's a million dollars for a um, cruise missile, right? The David Sling is million dollar. Right, no, the crew, like the American cruise missiles, like the ones they use in serial. Uh, oh, okay. They're okay. about a million bucks. A okay. million dollars a, to a, okay. a pop. Okay. <clears throat> so even at a $2 million is a very cost-effective. Even yeah. if you sell it for, it's a cost-effective. Yeah, it is cost-effective. For Americans, I'm thinking. The, so. the, the Americans are part of the error and the part of the David's things. They fund part of the development. 
So the, both of them considered to be the best worldwide. I mean, the Arrow, there is no such thing like the Arrow. There is the same capability for the Americans. They have other things, but it's not as capable as, uh, as the Arrow. So those uh, considered to be uh, leading worldwide uh, interceptor. Just to get you into the atmosphere, what we have been dealing with in Israel before we had the uh, before we had Iron Man, you see here a typical uh, case where people are celebrating the, something, and then they have 15 seconds to, to get into the shelter, which shelter which is a good make it, of course. And if your parents and your children are not nearby you, it is a disaster. And for many, many years we have been suffering from this kind of phenomenon. Right now, the thing that we, we understand that we are going to deal with will be many, many rockets that will be fired up, uh, uh, on us uh, simultaneously, and we have to make sure that we are capable in our systems to deal with so many, uh, so many rockets. Uh, the process of, uh, of firing uh, uh, the rockets, when the rockets is uh, fired, we, uh, it takes us less than a second to detect it, once we detect it, we cannot reach the rocket in the first stage of the rockets because it is probably in the in Gaza itself. Our launcher are in Israel, so it takes time for them to get to the to get to the rockets. And there are some heights that we uh, don't want to shoot the, the rockets because it might be an area where uh, we have UAVs, helicopters, or whatever is our own planes. So, and we don't want to shoot those rockets on the top of the head of our people, so there is a very narrow windows where we can shoot, uh, the, where we can shoot the rockets. The process starts with the fact that we are identifying what are the defended area. We cannot define every house all around Israel. If it is, a, let's say, a village where there are five houses on a, uh, 10 kilometers, then, uh, then uh, we probably will not define it as a protected area. And the reason is uh, uh, because we want to save interceptor out of, let's say, 10,000 rockets that has, have been uh, uh, fired upon us in Tsuketan, in, in, uh, in uh, Amudanan. We have uh, intercepted uh, about 2,000 of them because just those. 2,000 were going toward populated areas. So we don't deal with the ones that are in the open area. And the decision, uh, what are the protected area is decision that is made by, uh, by the Israel Air Force uh, in very high levels, so uh, we make sure that we are uh, covered. Uh, we put all of the system, the radar system, the command control system, the launcher, other sensors, and we start operating the radar. Once the radar detects that there is a metal on the air, we have less than a second, first of all, to decide that this metal is a rocket rather than our own UAVs, helicopters, airplane, or whatever. The command control system predicts when, where this rocket might fall, if it is in a protected area, then we are creating hundreds of solutions for each threat to make sure that in a cyber situation we <coughs> get the most optimized solution, which means we don't want one, one interception to interfere with the other. And uh, then uh, the system choose the best uh, solution for each, uh, for each threat. And on the right time, we give the command the, the command to launch the launcher to launch the interceptor, and then in the end game, the interceptor will open its eyes and be capable of shooting the shooting the rockets. This is the process that uh, we are following. Uh, we are following through the during the uh, firing of the interceptor. What we see here, we see a kind of layout of the system. Uh, the different color represents different priority of each area. And again, if it is power plant, we'll probably treat it differently than if it is just a, a small village or a, the age of, a, of any city. So we'll be using maybe more than one interceptor. Um, 
we see around the, the airplanes here a keep out zone, which means that if, there, if we see an helicopter running into this area, we would like to make sure that we are not intercepting around the helicopter or whatever it is, the airplane. We are not in, doing interception in this area, so we find a, 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 a huge space where we don't want any interception to be nearby any one of the of our airplanes. <coughs> um, and uh, we, the abreast, which I'm leading, I was the, leading the development of the command control system, the communication. Rafael is the prime contractor, it's a government owned company. Uh, they have uh, they've been the prime contractor. They have uh, developed the interceptor itself and the launcher. The interceptor <coughs> is uh, uh, the best of its kinds by uh, many aspects. It can work day, night, any type of weather. But the main point is that it is very cheap, very cheap related to other interceptors that we uh, that we know on the market. And the other point is that the maneuvering that you see that this interceptor is doing to be capable of reaching the rockets while we are talking about short range is something that you cannot find in any, in any interceptor in the world. Uh, there are 20, uh, 20 interceptors in each launcher. We are going to see that in the movie. The radar, the radar of IAI uh, Elta is uh, <coughs> the best radar in the world by meaning of being capable of detecting a very small object and tracking those objects. Uh, we, uh, the American, were looking for different radar to be capable of doing the same mission and they couldn't find it. They, they have doubt if this system would work. They've been in Israel many times telling us this system is not going to work because it's going to, going to be not possible to detect. The, 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 Interceptor will not be capable of doing this kind of maneuver and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, right now, this is the best uh, radar that we can, uh, that is uh, capable of uh, identifying uh, this kind, this kind of uh, of uh, rockets. The command control system is considered to be a very sophisticated command control system because we are connected to any sensors in Israel. There are many, many sensors, uh, not just in the Air Force that. We have to get collect all this data to correlate this data because if two sensors see two objects, we have to def to decide is there, is it two rockets that we are seeing or is it the same rocket? So we have to do all the data fusion, the correlation, and so on. Once we are doing and we have the tactical picture, we have to create hundreds of solution to be ca capable of identifying exactly which type of rocket is it because different type of rocket will have different treatment based on the position of the explosive of the rockets and so on and so forth. So this is considered to be a very sophisticated uh, command control uh, system. If we look at the <coughs> what the operator uh, see, uh, so he has the definition of the uh, defended area, different color again present different priority. And whenever there is a rocket that fall within the defended area, it will be a red uh, color <coughs> red. He can see where are the interception going to happen, and he can decide to uh, prevent the system from firing on those rockets or to abort the interceptor while in the air because of safety hazard and so on. And those rockets that are not in the defended area will be uh, colored by white, so we don't have to treat to deal with them and to look uh, after them and so on and so forth. There is a, a, a static keep out zone, what we call, which means uh, if there are a, a path where the airplane, the civilian airplane are moving, we can tell the system in advance, don't do any interception nearby. Uh, those, uh, this area, so we can make sure that no one, uh, will, nothing will be damaged or happened, uh, so we'll be suffer from that. Um, this is the way, this is the look of what the, the, the control system internally. Uh, and I'm going to show you some movies and uh, try to explain better what's happening in the system as we go. So this is uh, the test that we have done before 
before we become, the system became operational. And the system is mobile because we don't know how we're going to deal with the north part of Israel, the south part and so on. Especially at the very beginning when, when we had only three batteries, we have to be capable of moving them toward the... This is the command control system. And uh, everywhere, everything is set up in less than an hour. We have, we have to be operational. This is the radar uh, shelter. All the electronics is in there. This is the radar itself. This is the antenna. The thing that we have seen is the antenna that can uh, give us the capability to transmit and uh, talk to the interceptor while it is on the air. So there's four, four pieces total? Excuse me? Four pieces? The main, the main pieces are the, the launchers and the interceptor, the radar or other sensors that we are not showing here, and the command control system. So there three. is also communication, but yeah. it's just the... So those are the main three, three issues. What we are going to see here now, we are going to <coughs> launch a rocket, real rockets that we have uh, took from uh, the Palestinian. You see the rocket now, we have fired the, re the rocket. This is the interceptor. <clears throat> Here is the interception. You can see that the small pieces that uh, are falling are very, very small. They go down very slow. So we don't have to be careful too much about what might happen with the pieces of the, the metal fall. Here we are, we are having a situation where we are firing three rockets from one side, two rockets from the other sides. And the challenge is to be capable of uh, intercepting the right, uh, the right uh, rockets, the two out of five. This is the small object that the interceptor is running after that, after it. Okay, now we are having a so-called quick response. What we want to simulate here is the Gaza versus the Sderot mm. case, where it's very, very short time. So the main point that uh, you should look at is the maneuvering of the interceptor to be capable of catching this target, this uh, rocket. See, it went up, now it's going down dramatically, and then it takes left. Wow. This kind of maneuvering for this kind of interceptor is uh, unique to this uh, interceptor, and this will give us the capability to reach the, the rockets and uh, destroy it. Again, you can see, you can see the debris is going down very slowly. Two, here we have a case where we are having two interceptors versus six grad, and the challenge is always to find, to hit the right two uh, rockets up, out of the six. So this is simulating a salvo situation. We have been observing and we we'll see later on real case where we have been dealing with more than, uh, with more than six. You should see here, we'll see the interceptor passing uh, to the first uh, rocket, the second rocket, and go directly to the rocket that he, he was assigned to. It was assigned to. See the first one, the second one. You choose the third one. What did you do with the other four? They let them fall, they don't care. It's a test area yeah. so they can fall in the can fall on the ground. The real question. Yes. The more more interesting interesting question is you will see an eight of them get to the second next question based on what you have asked. So you can see now three of them 
going almost immediately. And then the fourth one would like to take distance from the other three to make sure that the previous interception will not interfere. So the fourth one will come only when the other ones are almost uh, hitting the, the rockets. Now start going out, those are already uh, there. And The way that it looked like the third, the last one was reaching the rockets from underneath. The last question what we are doing with the other, the other ones that we haven't hit, the main question is when we are firing two interceptors, the first interceptor, let's say, got to the rockets, to what, what we are going to do with the second one. The best thing for us is to use the second one to hit our neighbors, <laughs> uh, to hit the launcher at least. But what we do usually is we are, a, there is a graveyard, we call it, where we are asking the interceptor if he's not reaching the, the rocket to be exploded there. And the reason again is because uh, we don't want to damage uh, the Palestinians unless we have a visual uh, is that we make sure that there are no children around there, there are not civilians and so on. We are taking too much care about uh, our uh, neighbors. Yeah, I think that if we wouldn't, maybe the war was a little bit shorter. But it's <laughs> always the question, uh, what to do? It has to do with politics that I'm not going to deal with right now. <laughs> the, the, the now what you see here in Be'er Sheva, this is a real case. If the sound, so you see the, you hear the excitement of the, our people there. What we see here, we start seeing the interceptor. And look, look at what we're doing here. People are going out to take pictures and to take picture rather than going to the shadow, which is. Uh, not the right thing to do, but most of us, uh, unfortunately, are now. You can see that this uh, wedding it was uh, during the wedding, so the photographer of the wedding uh, changed the position of the camera and they uh, started uh, taking pictures. Uh, what we see here, we see mm -hmm. the interceptors. When it light, it means that it reached the rockets. This is the tail of the end of our interceptor. You see that it's coming from different launcher. We have two launcher here. And uh, what you are going to see here is about 15 interception in parallel with something that is very, very considered to be very sophisticated to try to handle so, so many interception in parallel and make sure that one interception is not uh, hitting the other ones. It's very complicated. How many rockets were launched in that case, not interceptors? How many in 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 uh, incoming rockets? Were incoming. There? 15 incoming rockets 15. in parallel, yeah, and we're counting the first one at the same time in the same area, it's not just the same time. Uh, we have to keep in mind that we have to make sure that one interception will not interfere with the other, and we have to have a huge amount of calculation because, let's say, if you have 10, if you have 10 sensors looking in the same area, yeah. you end up seeing 150 uh, rockets in the air. Now you have to decide which one is, is what. And correlating this data, it's a real-time big data analysis that we have to do. This is one of the most difficult part of, of our system to make sure that you don't see uh, two rockets as uh, one rocket or vice versa. You don't see, you don't want to shoot two interceptor on the same rocket just because two different sensors have right. been identifying it. So this is a very complicated uh, part. Uh, and also creating the right solution in real time, less than a second, all this uh, makes this system one of the best system, uh, defense system. How, how many interceptors went up there? Twelve? It was uh, fifteen. Fifteen rockets. <coughs> how many interceptors? Fifteen interceptors. So everyone got taken out? Uh, yeah. What we are, we, are, we are feeling very confident in the system. The very beginning we were shooting, if we are changing it dramatically, the software version, we probably would start with two interceptor on the same rocket, but once we get the confidence that the system is working properly, we want to save interse interceptor. That's the, the, the point. How many people are 
are, are tracking? Is it all automated or is actual people everything, sitting at a screen and... Everything is automated. Now there is a, a semi-automatic mode where uh, the Air Force can decide that he wants, they want to approve before the rocket, the interceptor will be launched because of safety reason, because they want to save the interceptors. Uh, not every time that they are interfering the system, it's for the good side of it. I mean, sometimes the operator might uh, might might de might de hurt the efficiency of the system from my point of view. Since we are recording it, I don't want to make an issue out of it, but uh, the system is basically automatic. automatic. Sometimes we want to make sure that there is no airplane, the, the, the interceptor at the very beginning, especially uh, following the routes that we have expected in, but it's a real-time issue. You cannot really start uh, controlling what's happening in the case, for example, of Beersheba, the operator cannot do too much for to help the system. But if the, if the commanding officer wants to abort it, he can literally abort, has... He can prevent the interception from uh, happening. He can prevent the interceptor from going out at the very beginning. But seconds, out. only seconds. Okay. Once the interceptor is out, he can abort the interceptor and ask it you know, not to hit the, the rocket, he can abort it immediately, he can abort it whenever he wants. So we have all the safety issues covered, uh, including the cyber security issues and so on. Yes. You mentioned you can abort it, you also talked about a graveyard. Can you ever reuse some of the parts to salvage? <laughs> uh, once, once it's in the air, we cannot reuse the... Is there a margin of error? Again? A margin of error. Like in term, missing a target, like is it? Based on the newspaper, right now we have been going from 85% uh, uh, probability of interception to 90%, and this is going up. This is going up because you have to keep in mind that uh, we didn't have all the batteries that we have right now. So part of missing, so-called, this quote, is because we didn't have enough launchers, we didn't have enough batteries to cover all the area. The, the more that we are going to have, we are going to uh, get a, a better coverage, and we are improving. We know why we have missed, and we are, from my point of view, we are going to face more than 95% probability of interception. Uh, and I'm not counting the ones that are in the open area, because they are on open area, just the ones that are going to go on populated area. What do you mean by based on the newspaper? It's between eighty and eighty-five percent. Eighty-five to ninety percent. I don't know what. What do you mean by based on the newspaper? We, you know, there are statistics that we know internally because we are recording everything. There are statistics that are coming from the newspaper. We don't want Just to. Publish. There are some measures that we don't want to publish formally. So. I see. We take okay. whatever is the newspaper. Public In this case, it's not a fake news. It's not far away from the reality. <laughs> so, so you can count on it. It's, uh, it doesn't really matter if it's 91% or 89%. So, you know, there are so many ways to look at it. If we decided not to fire, because we decided that it is not a, it is a, a area where it's a kibbutz, where there are 10 uh, buildings there, and we want to take the chances. Do you count this as missing interception or what? No. There are so many uh, no. factors no. to decide whether it was a, a, a malfunction or not. So, again, we are going toward 95, 96% uh, okay. probability of interception, a good coverage of Israel, uh, and we hope that we will not have to use it, yes. Correctly, I think we heard that Hezbollah has a tremendous number of rockets, wild numbers, hundreds, thousands. So let's talk about war. And they are throwing at us uh, great numbers. How does this system cope with 500 and 1,000? This system can deal with as many as rockets as we fire at us. We have been improving the last uh, years. <coughs> the system it was published that we have done a huge test. You can imagine as far as we can imagine, we've been dealing with, so we have closed a gap, technology gap of 20 years right now, 
and we are capable of dealing with the number of rockets that they can fire at us from Hezbollah, from the south. Any, any number you say? Any number. It depends on how many uh, batteries we are going to put. We, didn't, we don't have yet coverage, full coverage, because uh, let's say if we need, uh, if, let's say assume that we have 12 batteries and we need 20 of them to get full coverage, if we are using only 12 of them or only 10 of them, then it will be some of the villages will not be covered. That's by intention, because we want to save money, because there is politics, because we are waiting for the American to fund it, to fund the, the other uh, batteries. But there is no technology issue. If we want to get 100%, uh, we can even fire more than one interceptor, so uh, not 100, we never get to 100, but 99.9%. <coughs> for our refineries, for example, there is no way that they will be capable of hitting our refineries because for the refineries we probably would use more than one interceptor. So we have a good coverage. Uh, it went up from 85, as I said, to uh, 90 because we didn't have enough batteries and we are in a different position right now. It's just a matter of policy, what we want to protect, how we want to spread out the, the batteries that we have and so on. So the refineries are covered and the ammonia tank in Haifa? They will be covered pretty well. So now the question that I had was more the, um, I'm sorry, um, the question that I had was uh, everything is so highly computerized. What happens when malware happens like they're <coughs> talking about right now? I think that this is the most defended company, uh, uh, project from the cyber security point of view. I think that we have exaggerated, everything is encrypted, everything is protected. Nothing can go in unless some one of the soldier intentionally will, will come with uh, the spy and come with this key and put it into the system. And again, the system will reject any disk key that anyone will try to put in it. But if someone intentionally will do something internally, I mean, if one of our employees will not be will be a spy, then we might have a problem. However, every one of us are uh, being tested again and again to make sure that we are okay. Some of us are passing light detector and so on, so we got this covered as well. So we believe that we, it is very, very well protected. It's gonna be very hard, almost impossible to get into it. It's not connected to the internet or something like that, God forbid, or so, so someone can come from the outside. So we are pretty much covered with this uh, issue. Yes. From what you're saying, it sounds like if you're getting um if you're getting bombarded from different directions, that you can still handle them? If we are going to get from ma many. many of them from uh, both from Gaza and from Lebanon and from different parts of Lebanon and Gaza, we'll be capable of uh, managing that. We have tested it uh, carefully. We are very sure, pretty much sure that we can handle those. It's classified information, so I cannot, if I tell you the numbers that we have been no, testing, no, I just want to and show you, the, I show you the, 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 what we have been seeing, I mean, it's uh, dramatically, uh, the, the tests are uh, uh, dramatically good. It's a kind of miracle. Each, each interceptor can only take out one rock, yes. not two or three. Each interceptor is for one rock. It's in fact explode while yeah. it is nearby the, the rockets. The interceptors, different interceptors in the rocket, in the battery, or they're all the same? Again, <coughs> are the interceptors all exactly the same, or they're different types? There are two types of interceptor. We're not getting to it. Why? Why do we have to have two types, but uh, more than one type? The success of the interception looks like it depends a lot on the computation of the trajectory of the rocket that was fired. So. Uh, is there such a thing as a guided uh, rocket that can change its trajectory, let's say? There is a way to maneuver the ro rockets. Some of the rockets are produced not correctly, so they, <coughs> anyways, they get vibration and so on, but we have a way to deal also with, uh, with those kind of rockets. <coughs> there is such a thing as a, that they can change the trajectory of the rocket after it was fired? If it is not right now, they probably might do it later on. We don't want to give them too much, too many ideas, but we will be able to handle, we will be able to handle those kind of rockets as well. You, you just, you just said that your rocket doesn't hit their rocket; it explodes next to their rocket. 
Many times it catch it head to head and oh. we cannot prevent it. So from our point of view, when we have been testing the system, when it catch it uh, uh, head to head, we uh, were losing all the recording data and it was not good. So we couldn't prevent it from happening. Many times it's yet catch it hand to hand, but usually what we expect to happen is it, even if it does not uh, 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 intersect with the, the, the rockets. What, the, what we are doing is uh, when they are passing, we want the explosion of the interceptor to explode next to it. Ne next to it on the explosion of the rocket itself. So we get twice energy than, than uh, mm -hmm. not just our energy, but the energy of the, the, yeah, of the rocket, rocket itself. So this is the, the best case from our point of view. It's even better than it if it is. Uh, uh, hit it on the head. That's it. So if I try to summarize, uh, okay, no, no, no. we have to take the lead from the technology point of view, both from economic, economical point of view and from uh, and from the security point of view. The, re the reason why we are winning is first of all because because God is with us, Amen. but uh, but the other point is that. Uh, that uh, we have better technologies than our neighbors. And we have to keep this, we have to take the lead of this area in this case. And having uh, children learning in Akiva and learning in Akiva myself, we can take those 24,000 students and do a lot more with them, getting them prepared for the next stage for the universities and so on. They are the best potential because they will be the ones that be, will be very devoted to the country of Israel, they will not uh, look, be looking for the extra uh, box, you know, and so on. They will be, uh, they, they are the next generation, and we have to make sure that the next generation will be a lot better than we are, so we'll be able to, uh, to uh, win uh, the next war. So I, I truly believe that investing in education is better than investing in anything else. We have a say in Israel that uh, if you see Someone that need your help, you better give him a fishing rod rather than giving a, a fish, fishes to, to eat because he will be capable of doing it by himself. So the same goes with education. Investing in education, from my point of view, is the most important thing right now in Israel. Uh, Thank you, Nathan. And I, I, I think I think I won't exaggerate, and, and you understand um, who Nathan is, and I'm telling you that Iron Gnome is 10% of what he does in his company, and his company is a, is, is, is a very big company in Israel, um, and he thought that it's important enough to leave his company for five days and to come for Yeshiva Bnei Akiva uh, to Toronto and to New York to, 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 to meet people for our program. What we are doing in Israel, I'm Naftali Kandler, I'm running, I, I, I work with Shavim Akiva for the past 18 years in different programs, and I need to, I need to start with thanking Ilan Mazer and Mizrahi for, for hosting us and for, and for arranging uh, this event and, 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 and all our trip here in Toronto. Um, what we are doing in Israel, I think Shavim Akiva is a famous uh, national um, network that, that you all know about, 75 yeshiva, 24,000 a million. We are the leading uh, yeshiva in Israel. We have um, students who are the top students in Israel. They will go to uh, the, the best uh, units in the army, they will go to Yudav Shamon, they will, they'll, they'll, they'll be Torah. We have a very, very good educational center um, that, that will uh, strengthen their religious Zionism uh